Well, good morning. It's really nice to, to see you all. Nice to see people we haven't seen for a while here. Welcome. So excited uh, to, to see everybody looking back. Let me pray as we open and commit this time to God. Heavenly Father, we, we come before you with such thankfulness. Thank you, Lord, that we're here this morning in your presence, that you put it in our hearts to, to meet together, to worship you, to glorify your name. And Lord, we just commit this time to you that you will meet with us through your Holy Spirit. Lord, may our, our praise uh, be acceptable to you. Lord, we want to glorify you this morning, not just this morning, Lord, but in, in all aspects of our lives. But we thank you that we're here in your presence. Amen. We're going to really um, pick up that theme and run with it a bit. So we're going to stand if we're able and sing our first hymn, Tell Out My Soul. Let's uh, sing together. So announcements, um, Thursday drop-in. I heard last Thursday went extremely well. I saw uh, photos of pancakes that looked really good. So I was quite quite jealous, but nevertheless, it was great to see. Uh, hopefully a, a good time has had we're all. So this Thursday at seven o'clock, we'll meet. Um, won't be pancakes, but hopefully we'll still, uh, still have a good time. And then next Sunday, uh, God willing, we'll be meeting at 11. Uh, and then a four o'clock Zoom, both today and next Sunday. So I think that's it. Let me read from God's word. We've come to a new chapter uh, in John, John chapter 15. Uh, and it starts with uh, the seventh and final of the I am statements that the Lord Jesus makes in, in John um, particularly. So I'm just going to read uh, John chapter 15 and verses 1 to 8. John 15, 1 to 8. So Jesus is speaking. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. 
as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. Amen. Let's continue to worship God, shall we, as we turn to him in prayer this morning. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that we are reminded once again that you are, you are God, that you are the Son of God, that you are the um, Lord Jesus, that you are the mighty one. And we thank you, Father, for your son. We thank you for the teachings that we read about him and from him in your word. And Lord, we thank you for his death on a cross for us. Thank you, Lord, that our sin was placed on him. The wrath that was rightly ours, you turned onto your son. And we thank you this morning that we can come here and meet together in, in your name, knowing that our sins are forgiven knowing that our guilt has been removed, knowing that um, the wrath that was on us is on, on Jesus. And Lord, we thank you for the great encouragement that is, knowing that we, we don't need to fear the future. We don't fear death. We may not like it or enjoy it, but we don't fear it because, oh Lord, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And we thank you for that great truth. Lord, we pray that as we look into these words together, that through your Holy Spirit you will help us to understand, help us to take it in, to meditate on your word. Lord, to be fully oh, engulfed by it, we pray. And Lord, we, we commit those who aren't here, those who are away, those who are down south, those who are in Devon, we commit them to you. We pray for them as they go through really difficult times. And pray, Lord, for your presence for them as we pray that for ourselves. We thank you, Lord, for restoring to us our sister and we commit her and the family to you we thank you for the way that you are faithful for the way that you've blessed and kept us all safe and brought us together lord we remember too uh, those who are in authority over us we pray for them lord regardless of their political affiliation lord we just commit uh, the lawmakers of this land lord for Forgive us as a people for the, the laws that have been passed that are contrary to your word. And Lord, we pray that you will have mercy and be gracious to us once more. Lord, we pray for the Middle East. We pray for what's happening in Ukraine and in Russia, Lord, and the, uh, um, the wars and the conflicts there. We again pray for peace. Peace with you, our Heavenly Father. We pray for, for peace between peoples too. And Lord, we just pray now, commit this day to you, commit this time to you, that you will bless us as we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we come to the, the sermon, we're going to sing our, our next song together. He will hold me fast. Let's uh, stand if we're able and sing.
as I said, we've, um, we've come to the next chapter in John's Gospel, John chapter 15. Um, at the previous verse, the previous verse of chapter 14, verse 31, it says this, I do as the Father commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Rise, let us go from here. In other words, Jesus puts his, his entire ministry, especially these final saving hours, if you like, under the command of the Father. That's what he says, I do as the Father, as God, has commanded me. So the Father, Father God, is, is overseeing the whole thing. Jesus will give his life in a few hours. He will become, if you like, the bread of life, the water of life. And the door of life, all these, these pictures that we've seen as we've gone through John's gospel. But the Father himself is tending to every detail. So that this work that Jesus is carrying out will accomplish exactly what has been planned. And then you come to verse 50, um, chapter 15, verse 1, that Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. And, and this is a picture. This is, now I'm going to get, I, I looked at the difference between metaphors and analogies, okay, and I'm going to probably use them intermingly. I probably shouldn't. My English isn't brilliant, but you get the idea. But this is a metaphor. In fact, this is a metaphor of what he has just said. In effect, he's saying, as I complete my work in the next few hours, I become the source of all life all fruitfulness, the vine in effect. And my father, Jesus says, is tending the vine. He's seeing to it that the, the vine will bear all the living fruit that he intends. And that includes his attention to, to me, the vine, Jesus says, and to you, the branches. Now, the way that, that metaphors work is they really have quite a limited focus. If you broaden the, the focus out of this metaphor of, of Jesus being the vine and, and the Father as the, as the vine dresser, beyond what Jesus intended, well, there's a danger then. It will, it will communicate falsehood, not truth. So we have to be quite careful to understand what's being said here. So we need to understand the parts of the metaphor so that we can understand how to fulfill, if you like, our, our God-given purpose. We're here, aren't we? We're on this world. We believe that God has a purpose for our lives. And as we're still here, then God still has a purpose for our lives. And when, when our job is complete, if you like, when our purpose has been finalized, then God will call us home. So while we're here, we have a purpose. So what, what are we looking at here? Well, we're told, aren't we, that Jesus is the true vine and his father is the vine dresser. That's what verse 1 of chapter 15 says. Exactly that. I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. And as I said earlier, this is the seventh and, and the final of the I am statements, the I am claims of Jesus in John's gospel. But why, why would... Why would Jesus use this metaphor? Oh, we can understand some of the other ones we've looked at about bread and water and life and all those things as we look at them. But, but why this? Why, why vineyards? Why vines? Why vine dresses? What would, what would Jesus' disciples have thought when they heard Jesus make this claim? Would they have thought, what is he talking about now, about vines? Or would they have, would they have grasped something of what he was trying to explain to them? Well, to, to the Jew, especially those who were versed in the Old Testament, which they would have been, Israel is often referred to as God's vine that he planted. It, if you like, it, it became a, a national symbol that, that was on some of their coins. There was a, a golden vine over the entrance to the temple. All the way back in Isaiah, Isaiah 5 and verses 1 to 7, 
the prophet paints a picture of the Lord planting a vineyard and expecting to, to find good grapes at the harvest. But in those verses, it only finds, only produces worthless grapes. As a result, the Lord threatens to destroy the vineyard because it didn't fulfill his intended purpose. Psalm 80, well, that uses a, a similar, I'm going to use the word analogy now, but you get the idea. God, if you, in it we find, removes a vine from Egypt, planted it, and for a while it prospers. Does that sound familiar? God's people coming out of Egypt, going to the promised land, prospering for a while. But then in Psalm 80, we go on to read that the, the hedges that protected the vine are broken down and, and wild animals are, are coming and going and ravaging the vineyard. And so the psalmist cries out for God to, to turn again and to take care of this vine that he planted so that it what would be fruitful again. And there are lots of other actual prophecies in the Old Testament that use this same picture, that use this same analogy. Jeremiah 2 and 6, Ezekiel 17, 90, Hosea 10, verses 1 and 2. In each case, Israel was God's vine that he planted with the intention of what? That it would bear fruit. But what happened? They were disobedient and unfruitful. But now, John's Gospel, chapter 15, Jesus claims to be what? The true vine. In, in John's Gospel, we've already seen that Jesus is the, the true temple, the dwelling place of God with his people back in John chapter 2. Also, Jesus gives living water that, that Jacob's well couldn't give back in John chapter 4. Further, Jesus is the... The new Moses, if you like, who supplies God's people with what? Well, with true bread that comes down from heaven to give life to everybody who eats it in John 6. In John 7, Jesus fulfills and supersedes the Feast of the Tabernacles. John 8 and 9 picture what John 1 verse 9 declares. That Jesus is the true light of the world. So when Jesus tells his disciple, disciples that he is the vine, the true vine, he means that like un, sorry, that unlike faithless Israel, Jesus is the ideal realization of all that God intended for his people. He is the antipony, I can't even say that word, I don't know why I've wrote it down, the antipony of what God wanted his people to be. The perfect example, Jesus brought through forth the fruit that Israel failed to produce. And then Jesus adds, at the second half of verse 1 of chapter 15, And my father is the vine dresser. He owns the vineyard, in effect. He takes care of the vines. He cuts off the dead branches and prunes the ones that bear fruit. Why? so that they will bear even more fruit. And he is in control of the whole process. As the owner, he expects fruit from his vineyard. And he does what's necessary for it to bear fruit. So if that's the true vine and the vine dresser, what's Christ's purpose for all the branches that are found in him. Well, we read, don't we, that, that they should bear much fruit. And bearing fruit is a is a main is the well, yeah, it is the main theme, if you like, in this metaphor. We see it both negatively and positively in John 15, verse 2, where it says, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes it. So what? So it may bear even more, more fruit. The Lord mentions bearing fruit in John 15, verse 4, twice. Mentions it in verse 5, verse 8, verse 16, twice. So to understand this metaphor, we need to know what Jesus means by fruit. Am I expected just to sit and stand in a garden and 
and grapes magically appear from my fingers. What, what, what's going on here? How far do we take this? Well, to bear fruit, this sort of fruit, is to see God produce Christ-likeness in you and me. That's fruit. That's the fruit that's been spoken about here. While the word is used widely in the New Testament, in this context, it primarily refers to whatever the life of Christ produces in and through the believer who live in close fellowship with him. And that includes obedient, obedience to Christ's commandments, especially, remember that commandment to love one another? And this extends to all godly behavior. And yes, includes repentance and conduct that is pleasing to God. It encompasses experiences, Jesus' peace and joy. Remember that we looked at that in John 14, verse 27. And since love and joy and peace are the first three fruits of the Spirit, then I think we're safe to assume that we can extend the list to include the other fruits that we find in Galatians 5. You know, the, the patience, the kindness, the goodness, the faithfulness, the gentleness, the self-control. It also refers to, to seeing people come to Christ through your witness. And seeing them grow in Christ through your influence, I suppose, I suppose if you want to sum it up, fruit is Christ-like character, Christ-like conduct, and Christ-like converts. But obviously, I'm probably not the best one to speak about gardening, but we'll go on. It takes time to grow fruit. I want to plant something, and I want to enjoy it now. I want that strawberry plant to produce strawberries right now. Why? Because I love eating strawberries, or whatever it may be. But, but it takes time to grow fruit. So, so don't despair if you don't see all of these qualities fully developed in your life yet. But if you're a Christian this morning, you should see growth or, or progress in these things. You should be in the habit of obeying Christ. You should see the, the fruit of the Spirit increasing in your conduct. You should be hungering and thirsting after righteousness with increasing intensity. You should be looking for opportunities to what? To tell others about the Lord Jesus. If you're not seeing these fruits grow in your life, then you need to figure why not. Growth in Christ-like fruit should be the normal experience of every Christian. But also, the fruit that we will produce will vary in the, uh, the amounts and, and in the kind according to our spiritual gifts. We're not all the same. We're not given all the same gifts. We don't move in all the same circles. In the parable of the, the sower, back in Matthew 13, the good soil represents the true believers, and they bear fruit. But it varied, if you remember. Some bore a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. The soil didn't bear any fruit. <coughs> Sorry, the soil that didn't bear any fruit represents those who don't truly believe in the Lord Jesus. And also, yes, we are all given different spiritual gifts so that our fruit will vary. We aren't all going to produce pears. There's going to be some apples, maybe some raspberries, some sweet, you get the idea. We have different gifts, so we will produce different fruits, if you like. Determining your spiritual gift helps you to know where you should concentrate your efforts in serving the Lord. Those gifted in, in service will bear fruit that's different to those who who maybe have speaking gifts, but both are absolutely vital. But we should all exercise our gifts to glorify God. So I suppose the overall point is both clear and important. God saved you, God saved me to bear fruit for the Lord Jesus. 
If you profess to be a Christian, but you aren't bearing fruit, you need to examine yourself and maybe take some course corrections before it's too late. Why? Well, because we read that the branches that do not bear fruit are cut off and thrown into the fire. And there are two verses here that teach this. Um, verse, uh, verse 2 says, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And verse 6, If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away as a branch and dries up, and they gather them, cast them into the fire, and they are burned. But there's a debate about these verses. There's a debate over the, the meaning of these verses. So, so actually, we do need to look at them and examine them carefully. Some understand verse 2 to teach that, that believers may lose their salvation. Now, I, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail. I hope I don't need to go into a lot of detail to refute that view, since it contradicts so many clear scriptures here. After all, it's called eternal life for a purpose, isn't it? It's eternal life. Why? Because it's eternal. It's not temporary. Back in John 6, verses 39 to 40, Jesus makes it clear that he will not lose any. Let me say that again, that he will not lose any that the Father has given to him. But will give them eternal life and raise them up on the last day. In John 10, verses 28 and 29, Jesus says of his sheep, I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I love that picture. We may think we're holding on to him, but he's actually holding us. If it was up to me, I'd let go. I'm not that strong. But he holds us. But it's the picture of, of Jesus holding in his hand and of God holding us in his hand. We're safe. We're secure. And there are other scriptures that affirm that God keeps all whom he saves into eternal life. Look at Romans 8, Philippians 1. The list goes on. Others interpret John 15 verse 2 by, by emphasizing the phrase, in me. They understand Jesus to be referring to true believers who are in him. They interpret the verse then in one of two ways. Some will say that it refers to sin and to death, where, where God is disciplining sinning believers by removing them from this life. And you can sort of see that from um, 1 Corinthians 11 that we often read around the Lord's Supper or, or 1 John 5. But the problem is Jesus says that the Father removes every branch in him that doesn't bear fruit. And that doesn't seem to happen with sinning Christians. Others point out that the verb translates takes away can also mean lift up. And they argue that, that actually it's a picture of a, of a vine dresser propping up a branch that is drooping into the mud so that it gets light and air to help it begin to bear fruit. But in the light of verse 6, I don't think that's what Jesus is talking about here. In the metaphor, remember it's a metaphor, there are two types of branches. Some do not bear fruit and some do bear fruit. Those that do not bear fruit are not fulfilling their purpose. They're dead wood, in effect. What happens here, we read, they get cut off and thrown into the fire. They represent those who profess to believe in Jesus, but their life gives no evidence of saving faith. They don't bear fruit. We all know people who, who on the surface have said, yes, I'm a Christian. Maybe they even say the right things. Maybe they even come to church, for a while at least. But there's no fruit. They're not becoming more like Christ. In the context, remember where we are in John chapter 15? If you like, in the context, it would refer to Judas Iscariot. Remember who, who professed to believe. If you were looking at the 12, you'd say, oh, he's one of Jesus' 12. He must be a follower. He is a follower. Look, he, he's followed Jesus for three years. He went out preaching even in Jesus' name. Oh, but his real God, 
his real God was grieved. And in support of this, in verse 3, Jesus tells the eleven, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to, to you. And again, that takes us back into John 13. You see, it's easy to understand Scripture by Scripture, isn't it? We use Scripture to understand Scripture. And, and John 13 is just where, where remember the, the foot washing time where Jesus washes the disciples' feet. And Jesus says to them, you are clean, but not all of you. And John explains that he was referring to Judas as the unclean one. Judas was the unfruitful branch that was taken away and whose final end was to be cast into the very fires of hell. But then what about that phrase, in me? That sounds like, doesn't it? It describes someone who is a true believer. Remember, this is a metaphor, an analogy. And you can't press every point in such figures of speech. Also, in, in Matthew 3, John the Baptist calls out the Pharisees who thought that they were children of Abraham. and That was enough to get them into God's, God's kingdom, even though their lives did not bear the fruit of repentance. And he tells them in Matthew 3:10, Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. In Romans 11, the Apostle Paul pictures Israel as an olive tree where some of the branches are, are broken off because of unbelief. And, and the believing Gentiles, remember, we're looking at Acts at the moment, and the believing Gentiles are grafted in. The Jewish branches who thought that they had a sure place in God's kingdom because of their Jewish religion, but who rejected Christ, would be cut off. Only those who, are, who truly believe in him will be saved. And since Jesus is the true vine, the fulfillment of how Israel is, is pictured in the Old Testament. The branches in him that are taken away and cast into the fire do not re represent true believers, but rather those who think that they are Christians because they go to church. But they lack the genuine evidence that they are believers. They lack the fruit of, of Christ-likeness in their lives. They are like those that James speaks about who say they have faith but have no works. Their claim is bogus. But what about the branches that do bear fruit? Well, the branches that bear fruit are pruned so that they will bear more fruit, much fruit. Note the progression in verse 2. The Father prunes the branches that bear fruit so that they will bear more fruit. In verse 5, the branches that abide in Christ bear much fruit. And this points to the, the process involved in bearing fruit, which takes time. At first, you will bear maybe some fruit. But as time goes on, you should bear more fruit. Finally, the, the vine dresser wants you to bear much fruit. And to accomplish this, Jesus cleans you with his word. And the vine dresser prunes you. Jesus says in verse 3, you're already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Clean is the noun in Greek related to the verb prune or prunes in verse 2. As I understand it, Jesus is saying that the word he has spoken to them has already cleaned them in the sense of salvation. Their sins are forgiven. It's comparable to that bath that he spoke to, speaks about back in John 13, which cleansed them all over. But the Father further prunes them, cleans them repeatedly. Why? So that they become more fruitful. Again, this is comparable to the, the repeated foot washing that we saw. And that's necessary to walk in fellowship with the Lord Jesus. The pruning is the essential discipline that all true children of God must experience if they're to grow. If they're to grow the peaceful fruit of righteousness we read about in Hebrews 12. I've said it here before. My wife will back me up. I know 100% in this. I'm not much of a gardener. I'm not. I can't weed because I don't know what should be there and what shouldn't. 
The only bit of weeding I do is where we have some gravel and I've been told there shouldn't be anything green in the gravel. So I will pull those out. I'm happy with that. Anything else, I'm not safe. Oh, I cut the lawn because I know how to use a lawnmower. So that's, that's it. Everything else, all the skillful stuff, all the knowledgeable stuff, Ali does. Well, I was reading of a, a guy, and I don't think he's much of a gardener either. His name is Bruce Wilkinson. And he, he wrote a book, Secrets of the Vine. And he tells about moving from the city to the country one spring. And, and the fence that he shares with his neighbor that had a large grapevine on it. And he and his family were looking forward to enjoying some, oh, some nice grapes in the autumn. But a few days after moving in, he noticed that his neighbor was outside hacking, that's the way he describes it, hacking away at the vine with some large uh, shears. And he was worried that his neighbor was going to kill the vine. And being new to the area and, and new to the neighbor, he, as he was, trying to be diplomatic, he walked over and asked the neighbor, you don't like grapes, I guess? Love grapes, he replied. Bruce tried to express his hopes that they perhaps could share some of the grapes when they came and was a bit confused and disappointed over what the neighbor was doing. And observing that he was from the city, the neighbor explained, well, son, we can either grow ourselves a lot of beautiful leaves or we can grow some really nice, juicy, sweet grapes, the best you've ever seen but we just can't have both. He knew that to bear good fruit, that vine had to be pruned. And you can't bear fruit for the Lord unless the heavenly gardener prunes your life. Friends, pruning, pruning isn't very pleasant when it happens, but it yields a bigger, better crop of fruit in the long run. The fact is that, that when we, when we came, became Christians, when we came into the Christian life, we, we brought with us a load of old rubbish, a load of flesh and the world with us. And God actually, it, it's a sign of graciousness that he didn't just hack it all away at once. That's what probably bleed to death. But if you want to be like Christ, it's got to go. And if that sounds unpleasant... Well, keep in mind that his aim is that his joy would be in us and our joy would be made full. But you've got to submit to the pruning process, trusting that God the Father knows what he's doing. But there's one other key concept in these verses, and that shows our responsibility if we want to bear fruit. You see, as, as branches in the true vine, we must abide in Christ. And that verb abide or remain, it's used 11 times in, in John 15. It's 40 times in John's gospel. It's 27 times in John's epistles. And the sense of Jesus' word here in verse 15, abide in me and I in you, is probably abide in me and I will see that I abide in you. In other words, Live in such a manner that you are at home in me, Jesus says, and that I am at home in you. It's much the same as, as we saw back in John 14, 23, where Jesus said that both he and the Father would come to the one who keeps his word and make their home with him. And inherent in that concept is that we are in a long-term, close, growing relationship with Jesus. Jesus is looking at the overall direction of our lives. To know him as saviour and Lord means that we invite him to, to move into our hearts, move into our lives and live there as, as permanent Lord of all, of what we do and, and what we are. And as he lives there, we don't want to do anything that would make him uncomfortable to be there. We let him clean out the rubbish that offends him. And the longer he lives with us, the closer we know, we grow to know and to love and to disclose himself to the one who has and obeys his commandments. The abiding relationship. 
also implies dependence on Christ. That's what his words in verse 5 indicate. For apart from me, he says, you can do nothing. He means that apart from dependence on him, we can't bear good fruit that remains. But abiding is not, it's not effortless. It's not a passive thing. Some people teach that. They say, oh, just as the branch effortlessly, let, effortlessly lets the, the life of the vine throw through it, so you do nothing. And I've also heard it said that if you're striving, you're not abiding. But that, that type of teaching, that's, that's out of balance. The Bible talks again and again about the need to strive against sin in Hebrews 12. Paul said that he labored and strived for Christ, but added that he did so according to his power. That's Christ's power, which works mightily in him, in Colossians 1. Paul, Paul pictures the Christian passively sitting here in his deck chair. No, he, he pictures them as the Christian life as a battle. As a, as a fight, as an athletic contest. Not sitting doing nothing. The New Schofield Reference Bible helpfully explains what it means to abide. It says this, I quote, To abide in Christ is on the one hand to have no known sin unjudged and unconfessed, no interest into which he has not brought, no life which he cannot share. On the other hand, the abiding one takes all the burdens to him and draws all wisdom, life, and strength from him. There's not unceasing consciousness of these things and of him, but that nothing is allowed in the life which separates from him. Nothing in our life can make him uncomfortable. Things that we hear, things that we see, things that we do, we shouldn't do things that make that would make him uncomfortable. So I suppose these words, so our Lord's words should cause us all to ask, am I bearing fruit for the kingdom? Am I joyfully submitting to his loving pruning in my life? Am I daily abiding in Christ, making him at home in my heart? That's the purpose for which he saved you and me. Don't live for anything less. Amen. We're going to sing our last hymn this morning. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Let's stand if we're able and sing together.
Oh, Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for your son. We thank you for the picture we have here of the Lord Jesus being the true vine and you as the vine dresser. Lord, we pray that you will prune us. Prune us as you see fit. So we will bring, uh, live lives that are glorifying to you, lives that are pointing people to you, that we'll become more like our Savior, more Christ-like every day. Lord, we, what we ask for, we don't ask lightly. We know it will be hard at times and difficult, but we pray, Lord, that you will have your way with us in our lives. To your glory we pray. Amen.